Hello, I'm Christine and it's 2020! Today I'm gonna be talking about my first reads of the new year and the few other things I've managed to watch during December and the beginning of January, but for the most part I've only read stuff. I saw only finished two books, I'm close to finishing a third, all three are great, I can't wait to talk about them. I'm also going to talk about reading goals today because I don't have any ever and this is the first year that I've counted how many books I've read, which is so weird. All y'all book people count how many books you're reading here and I feel like that's too much pressure. I just assumed that like I must read a certain amount. So we'll talk about that too. Let's do this. Welcome to Stop Reza 8 this month. <laughs> Off the hook, but the phone never rang. Beast on the beast, no claws, no fangs. Me first book that I finished this past month was A Curse So Dark and Lonely by Bridget Kemmer. This was our December book explosion book of the month and it was excellent. If YouTube didn't hate book talks, then I would be doing a book talk for this baby. I'd be doing a book talk for all the books that I read this month because I loved them. <laughs> we were working with Bloomsbury in December. The second book, A Heart So Fierce and Broken, came out January 7th, so you can binge these now. This is a Beauty and the Beast retelling. It is by far my favorite Beauty and the Beast retelling that I've ever read. It was full of heart. The core characters are so well written. They're so fleshed out. You can feel them. You know, they're all real people and you care about them all in different ways and you just want everything to work out. There's this prince that is under this curse to relive the season of fall to winter over and over again until someone falls in love with him. And he's done this hundreds of times and failed every time. What I love so much about this version of it is that he's not the beast in the beginning. He's just a dude. After two and a half, three weeks, he turns into a beast, like an uncontrollable werewolf type of beast where he's not in his right mind. He has kind of a deadline to make this love happen. And if it doesn't, he's forked. And he's only got one guard left with him because he's killed all the other guards. This guard, Gray, is very resilient and has managed to survive thousands of failed seasons when he turns into a raging werewolf beast. I just keep saying werewolf because that's the easiest comparison in my head, but every season he turns into a different type of beast. They live in this parallel universe the witch who has cast this curse has made it so his guard can travel between universes to bring a girl to this universe because too many girls from his own kingdom have lost their lives, I think, in the process here. So now they're taking people from our world. So they pop in to our universe and take a girl every season to hopefully fall in love with this prince. And this season we take Harper, who is just the best. She's so feisty and so unafraid to speak her mind. And she's constantly underestimated and she's constantly breaking through those expectations. It's amazing to watch. I'm just enjoying the crap out of our heart so fierce and broken. I listened to the audiobook for A Curse So Dark and Lonely. I had an advanced review copy of it, but it just came out January 7, 2020, so you can get the audiobook now. I'm an Audible affiliate, so you can use my link in the description and get your first audiobook for free. If you want to use it for A Curse So Dark and Lonely, you can. It's amazing. I love this character so much. There are links in the description to these books if it sounds at all interesting to you. Highly recommend it. I'm so upset that I had to film my favorites of 2019 video before the end of 2019, like two weeks before, and this was my last finished novel of 2019 and I couldn't get it in there. You can bet it's gonna be on the 2020 list. Most of the movies I watched this past month I already talked about in either my best movies of 2019 or my worst movies of 2019 video. I'm just gonna quickly roll through them with some one-liner opinions and if you wanna hear me talk about them more, you can watch those videos. We've got The Irishman, wasn't a fan, I've seen this story before, told better, and it took way less of my life to watch it. Little Women was excellent. You should go see it. You have to go see it. Marriage Story was devastating. It was so, so sad. It was very, very hard to watch, but great performances. And 1917, this was a work of art. It was a masterfully choreographed cinematic triumph. It's about two guys trying to deliver a message in enemy territory during World War One. You never watch World War One movies because World War One feels like a big, hot, meaningless mess when you think about it too hard. So it was cool to see a film take place in that time and be attached to these characters. It was good. It wasn't like a heartwarming journey. It was stressful, but it was good. The last movie that I watched this 
month was Rise of Skywalker the third and final in the new Star Wars trilogy. The fandom for Star Wars in general has gotten very toxic, or maybe it was toxic, I wasn't a part of it before this. Everyone's mad about everything ever, no one can ever be pleased. I've really enjoyed this new trilogy. I've had so much fun. I feel like the characters are so much more real and there's so much more fun dialogue and they have great back and forths with each other in this new trilogy. I was invested in Raylo. And so I enjoyed The Rise of Skywalker. I love the new robot. I loved all the Poe stuff. I found it really funny. I loved everything with Rey and honing her force and the healing stuff. I enjoyed myself. That's all I can ask of a Star Wars movie. I don't know. There's something about it that just can't connect with 100%. So I'm there for the characters. And I was there for the sexual attention in The Last Jedi. And some people were like, there was no sexual attention. Uh, if you think there was no sexual attention, I don't know what movie you are watching. That force talk was hot. It was firing. It was intense. What do you mean there was no sexual tension? Yes, it could have been better if it was two films, but Star Wars works in trilogies and no one wants to break up the trilogy. No one wants to make a Star Wars quad trilogy, quad four movie, I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna give it an A minus. Now, let's talk about the book that I so badly want to talk about. And don't worry, I'm not gonna spoil anything. This is a story I hate this month. We're cool, it's chill. But I need to talk about Ninth House by Lee Bardugo. I wish, I wish, I really wish I could do a book talk about this. And I'm sorry, I know you're gonna be like, why don't you just do it, Christine? Why are you living by the laws of YouTube and the YouTube algorithm? And it's because I can't have my channel crashing every second of my life. I just crashed it with my toll book talk and it's just slowly trickling back to a normal life. It's not even there yet. That's what happens when I make book talks now. So I didn't record one for this, but boy, did I have a time reading it. I cannot wait for more. I was talking to Jesse and Kat about this. They said that Lee visualized this as a seven book series. <laughs> I thought it was gonna be a duology or something. It left off unfinished. There's one thing that I was waiting to see happen the entire book and then it finished and we didn't get to see it happen. You did not just end this book without a publication date for the next book on that end. But she did. If you don't know, this takes place at Yale in the world of secret societies, which is fascinating. I knew nothing about secret societies. Lee Bartuga went to Yale, which I did not know, and she was in one of these secret societies. And it's more fun not to know which one she was in until after you read this, because you learn about these secret societies throughout the book. At first, they're throwing all these names of the societies at you, and you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't worry, you're gonna learn about them as you go. It's an urban fantasy. It's one of those, you gotta give it a second. Your brain will soak it in and you will have all the knowledge by the end. What I hate about this end and not having the second book, I'm gonna forget about all these societies by the time book two comes out. They're fresh in my brain right now. I want the second one right now. But alas, it's not worth me waiting to read this. I'm sure the second one will refresh us in the beginning, you know? The audiobook for this was so, so good. So I did the audiobook over Christmas and I was listening to it. At first, you know, when I was getting ready in the morning at my mom's house, and then I was purposefully doing things where I could listen to this. Like, I'd go for an hour to Starbucks break so I could sit in my car and drink my drink and listen to Ninth House because it was excellent. It got more and more intense. This is a rated R book. It's an adult book. It feels weird clarifying that things are adult books, but I know I have youths in the audience here. If you're under the age of 13, I wouldn't pick it up. It has a lot of harder themes in it. The lead character is a very troubled, young woman who gets a scholarship to go to Yale and she didn't even apply there. They come to her because she has a special ability that she doesn't understand that the societies know more about than she even does and they bring her in because of this ability. Do you want me to tell you what it is? She can see ghosts and it's just the coolest and the scariest and that's where everything comes in. So these societies deal with magic. Ancient, weird, sacrifice-y magic and all magic of course always has a price and normal people in these societies, they know that greys exist. That's what they call ghosts, but they can't see them unless they take this concoction that is basically poison. Like it could kill you. Every time you take it, it's a risk. If you get too old and you take it, there's a high probability that you die. If you mix it wrong, you could die. There's a lot of different stuff going on. Needless to say, there are high stakes. She is brought into the society that was basically made to just monitor the other societies because the other societies can run rampant doing all this crazy magic shit that could hurt other people if they're not careful because it involves using 
bring other people sometimes. And they bring randos into the fold to use them for their magic ceremonies. <laughs> and it is uncomfortable and mind-boggling and heart-pounding to read this story and see from her point of view. So we switched back and forth from this young woman's point of view and from the head of Lethe, the society that watches over the other societies to make sure they don't kill people and do terrible shit. There is a head of Lethe and there is like a Lethe trainee who will eventually replace the head of Lethe. So she's the trainee, he's the head of Lethe. We go back and forth between their point of views. Her name is Alex, short for Galaxy, which, oh, and his name is Darlington. I love the characters. I love how dark this gets. I love the intensity of the plot, the themes running through it. I love everything. I'm so excited and I'm so glad I read this now. So I can be extremely excited for the second book for as long as it takes for it to come out. The Scythe trilogy just ended and that was the series that I was most excited about other than Cassandra Clare's books, which I'm always excited about. Now I have another series that I'm so incredibly excited about. This is by far my favorite Lee Bardugo book that I've read thus far. Like I love Six of Crows and I love Crooked Kingdom and the Grishaverse is cool, but Nine Thousand is amazing. You have to read it. Unless you're not close enough to adulthood to read it because it has serious themes and issues inside it. But if you are, read it. Before we get into some reading goals talk, I watched two Netflix series over the last two months, which is just not a lot for me, you know. If you've been here for a while, you know I usually have like 50 billion seasons of TV that I've managed to watch somehow in one month. Every moment has been crammed with me working on something. I finished You season two, which wow, it was a ride. It's tough because season one of You is one of those perfect seasons of TV, in my opinion. It was so excellent and so creepy and thrilling and I was on the edge of my seat, scared, but in the best way. In season two, we know the formula, right? We know more about Joe. It was interesting the turn we took because you know someone's gonna be his target and it's just a question of who and you don't want it to be certain people. It's different from Dexter but you start to like certain aspects of Joe even though you hate Joe and certain aspects of it I feel like went a little far like it went wild. By the end of this season I was like <laughs> okay I'm not sure how much I bought it like I was on board because I was having fun but also at the very end of the series the way they've set up for season three I wasn't thrilled with that because it felt like we did all this stuff and went through so much and then he wiped it clean in an instant in the very last second of the season with something that he said. I don't know, it's fascinating. It's a fascinating character study and I'm gonna keep watching it. He's becoming more aware of himself and what he is in this season because of what happened in the first season. But he's not so self-aware that he can compare himself to other people around him accurately. I'd give season two a B plus. The other Netflix show that I watched just this past week, I think, is spinning out, which was amazing. I started watching it and I couldn't stop. It was so, 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 so good. I'm so glad I watched it. It ended on like an annoyingly annoying cliffhanger because all I want to do is watch more spinning out. I want those characters. I want to see the thing that they left off on. I was like, how could they leave it? Like, if you watch it, like we're building up to a certain thing in that last episode and then, you know, it, we cut off and it's like, excuse me, bish. I have been looking forward to watching this and you turned it off right when it was supposed to happen. Of course, there's setting us up for season two and I'm excited. I'm gonna watch season two. The season was really, really great. It focuses a lot on mental health. The mother in the series is bipolar and so is the lead character played by Kaya Scalderado and they're both trying to just live their lives and deal with it and it's very difficult. And then Willow Shields from The Hunger Games who plays Katniss's younger sister. Prim is the younger sister in Spinning Out. She's also a figure skater. If you like figure skating or watching figure skating, oh my gosh, I just love watching all their routines. Any figure skating scene, I'm like, <gasps> and I'm just so invested. You get to know these characters, then you're watching them so anxiously when they're doing their routines. When they go for a jump, you're like, <laughs> you're usually like that. But never so much have I been like that, that watching them in this show about fictional characters rather than watching real people at the Olympics. At the Olympics, you're like, you know, you're invested, but not like you know them. We know them here. This is intense. We've been working for this all season. Like if season one and A minus, there are parts where the score got really loud and a little cheesy in the first couple episodes. That's, I think, what's taking it down from being like an A or an A plus. There's some rocky moments there where they're finding their footing. Okie dokie, let's quickly talk about some reading goals. Now, I see everyone doing this 100 book reading goal, this 50 book reading goals all the time on Twitter and stuff, and I've never attempted to do them. I never care how many books I read in the year. You know, I just want to read as many as I can and enjoy as many stories as I can, and I think that's a healthy approach, and I don't mind that I do that, but I've never even tried to count, and this year I counted. I read only like 27 books, and I I know that's a lot in terms of everyone else outside the book bubble. Some people read like five books in a year or 
12 is a good number, like one a month for some people. But 27, when I'm like, people are reading 50 and 40 and 100 books a year. How did I read so few? How could it only be 27? But I guess I should be thankful that I even got through 27 and it's all thanks to the glory of audio because I can listen while I'm doing other things so I can read and be a productive adult, which is very important. I'm really curious now as to like, how many books did I read in 2012? Like a million? I was reading like two books a week for a time in 2012. That's a lot. It's a lot of books, okay? I'm curious like outside of this book bubble, outside of the immediate book two bubble, how many books everyone has read in the past year? I'd love to know how many books you read last year. Now that I have a marker for how much I have read so I can like log in my brain how hard it is to read 50 books in a year let alone a hundred please share your number in the comments as for 2020 again I'm not setting any reading goals I'm hoping to read as much as I can as much of the books that I've wanted to read in the past couple years that I can and that's really all there is there if setting a reading goal is helpful to you I'd say go for it but if it just puts unneeded pressure on your reading why do it and those ladies and gentlemen were all the stories that I ate this month my favorite one Oh, I think I have to give it to Ninth House. Damn! It was excellent. You should read it. You can use my Audible affiliate link to get your first book and get Ninth House too! If you didn't use it for something else. I'm Christine. Thank you so much for watching. I make videos every week and I will see you next time. Goodbye!